Welcome to Growing E-Commerce. I'm your host, Mike Ryan of Smarter E-Commerce, also known as Mech. Today, it's just me, so buckle up. I've recently prepared some year-end review data for 2022. Let's take a walk through that. I'm focusing on some macroeconomic data on the one hand, like consumer confidence and inflation, and on the other hand, some channel data for Google Ads, in particular, shopping and Performance Max. I'm no economist. I don't have all the answers. I can just humbly offer you my imperfect opinions and speculations on these topics. And I hope you'll find that um, a thought-provoking exercise. If you hard disagree, you can rant at me on Twitter or LinkedIn. My handle on both platforms is Mike Ryan Retail. I look forward to hearing your objections. <laughs> all right, let's get into it. Ooh, where to start with 2022? <clears throat> um, well, I, I pulled some data from Salesforce from their shopping index. It's really a great free resource. Um, they just aggregate everything that they've got access to. Um, and it's they've got a lot of different metrics in there. I just looked at year-over-year e-commerce growth. And it's available on a quarterly basis per market, per vertical as well. So... I looked at Germany, UK, France, the three largest economies in Europe where, where I'm based, and then looked at apparel, electronics, health and beauty, being three of the biggest verticals out there. The numbers are all below the 0% line all year in terms of um, e-commerce revenue. And I mean, I think it's it's no wonder we, we, we know this by now, the, the pandemic just artificially inflated um, the the significance of e-commerce for a period of time. We were sort of, I like to think of it as sort of a time machine. I think we saw, a, you know, a share of total retail, an e-commerce share of total retail where one day we will arrive, but it, it did snap back to normal. And um, this has been discussed to death with, you know, the layoffs at Shopify and how much they bought that that kind of um, five years growth and three weeks narrative or whatever the case might be. And it's become more popular lately to mention, well, actually, e-commerce is bigger than ever. And it's 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 really healthy still. It's um, definitely like, OK, that that share of total retail snapped back. But um, ultimately, e-commerce grew and it retained the size of the new market um, and it's just retail also grew. It grew a lot, grew a lot more. Um, so, in a nutshell, the whole branch is just booming, and, and that's good. But in year-over-year year comparison terms, it's a bit painful. What we see from the Salesforce data, the shopping index, um, is that Q2 was the here in Europe at least was the most painful quarter in year-over-year year terms, particularly in Germany and France. Um, UK had a really painful Q3, but um, it was it was definitely a tough year. And, and if we look at like apparel, electronics, health and beauty, electronics suffered a lot, um, minus 10% year over year in Q2. That was the biggest loser, so to say, um, of of that of those three for the whole year. And yeah, apparel the year over year. Losses kept mounting quarter after quarter um, up until Q3. And then it had a bit more of a positive Q4, but it was still, it was down a lot. Um, so it, it's just a challenging time across markets, across verticals. If you've been struggling to grow, I think you're, the message here is that you're not alone and that the closer you can get to 0% or above 0%, it suggests that you're actually gaining market share when everyone else is, um, you know, when you look at the market as a whole and you see that everyone's well below the zero axis at the aggregate level. So that's important to remember. It's just about having the right expectations. And on a positive note, you know, we're no longer competing against those booming, hypey, <laughs> hypish uh, 2021 numbers anymore. Now this year, we're going to be working to grow against kind of a new baseline and um, th that we established in the last year. So I 
hope that we're through the worst of this. I think the big question is what's going to happen in terms of aggregate demands, what's going to happen, uh, this will they, won't they thing with the recession. Uh, I, I think I probably mentioned it before on this podcast, but uh, it was New York Times publishing a headline that uh, the vibes in the, in the economy are weird or weird vibes. Yeah, that's where we are right now. And to put that in context, um, I want to look at inflation and I want to look at consumer confidence. <clears throat> so inflation has just been mounting and mounting since really January 2021. So we're now well into it. And, um, you know, I, I, I looked at the uh, harmonized index of consumer prices from Eurostat and compared like Germany, France, Netherlands against the EU average. And the annual rate of change was for the EU average was as high as 15% in 2022, where you had markets like Netherlands that were peaking up at 25%. And France, on the other hand, not as bad. They were peaking around like 10%. Germany was more or less following the, the EU average, where I'll just add that, you know, in the last months of the year, we did start to see some relief here. Like prices are still high, but that annual rate of change is... Uh, seems to be cooling down a little bit, bringing some relief maybe to consumers and hopefully um, a more positive year ahead because <laughs> really we're just in this wage inflation, price inflation kind of cycle that I, I don't know. I, as, I, as I said at the start, I'm not an economist, but I don't know exactly how you resolve a situation like that. I do get worried when I, I look at, maybe you've seen it before, there's a chart that's being updated and, and shared once in a while. It shows, it's, it's based on the US, um, where they're looking at the amount of, of debt that consumers are carrying, like total credit card debt, compared to the average savings rate of consumers. And, um, you know, it's this really strange and fascinating phenomenon because I think the average savings rate was around 8% or so, and there was a lot of debt. This was back in 2019, mind you, and people consider that an unhealthy picture already. Then the pandemic came in and there was lockdown. People had less opportunity to spend. People were spending uh, more conservatively. And so you see debt starting to pay off a bit and savings rates spiked. They went really, really high, all the way up to 33%, in fact. And there were another couple of bumps there from stimulus checks coming through. Like a year later, there were some, some bumps. But now we're at this place where personal debt is just higher than it has ever been. It's very alarming to look at. And savings rates, I mean, the data that I looked at, uh, it's a bit older now, I'd have to check where it is currently, but in November, December um, of, of 22, it was down to like 3%. So the picture is way worse than it was before the pandemic. And yeah, I think the big concern that I have is people are saying, are we in a recession? Aren't we? Will we be? Won't we? And I, I don't want to be like beating <laughs> the drum of doomsday or something like that. But when I see a picture like that um, in such a massive economy, the U.S., because I think that the debt problem is not as bad here in Europe um, and savings rates are not as bad here in Europe. But um, it doesn't matter if, if things go boom in that economy, then uh, we're all going to be in, in some trouble. But let me... <laughs> Let me put a little more positive spin on it. I mean, if we look at consumer confidence for the last couple of years, it's really interesting because here in Europe, the, the confidence level, this is based on OECD data, the confidence level was dropping sharply in the pandemic. Although um, we can assume similar effects were happening here in Europe, like people paying off debt, people improving savings rates. Um, I think it depends, of course, what what branch you were working in and so on. Uh, generally, the 
the kind of social safety net here in Europe did a pretty good job of picking up the pieces in terms of the, um, you know, the employment challenges that we were facing then. But confidence dropped down in like the, I don't know, 96 range all the way through 2020. And it was lowest in the UK. And then it rebounded a lot in, in 2021. There was a lot of optimism. And, you know, the interesting thing is that the UK saw the highest rebound. The US, the UK was seeing the lowest lows and the highest highs in terms of um, confidence. And that continues to an even more extreme in 2022, where the bottom just fell out of confidence in the UK relative to, for example, Germany or France or the overall European benchmark. But as I said, to put a, a slightly more positive note on it, we see those numbers starting to turn up in the last couple of months. And I'm sure that that's probably related to the fact that, as I mentioned, we saw inflation coming a bit under control cooling down a bit relative to where it was in the last couple months of the year. So actually, you know, my message of hope here is that the last couple months of the year were positive. Um, and I just, I think in, in Europe, there's just with the war in Ukraine and everything, there's been a lot of uncertainty in terms of the energy um, the supply and what this is doing to to keep messing with, with prices. Also like this, zero COVID policy in China has been very disruptive to the supply chain. My sincere hope, and I think the most optimistic case that, that I can imagine, is that we've just been seeing like these whiplash effects or fishtailing, um, you know, overcorrecting in both directions. And, and I hope that's going to kind of start to shake out a little bit. And we'll see that this, uh, the, that these strong reactions are, and and uh, yeah, whiplash effects are just going to start to normalize a little bit and calm down. And if I put on my advertiser hat for a second, um, the question that comes up is, so what? Or what, what is, how does this all tie together into, into advertising? And, <clears throat> um, you know, we, we, we've seen in the last three years, the stuff we've seen, it's insane. We saw companies that had to shut down their web shops um, in the first weeks of the pandemic because they, they, they weren't prepared to handle the traffic that was coming at them. Um, or they shut down their paid campaigns because they the demand just skyrocketed and they didn't need that anymore. And we also saw opposite effects where sadly we've seen companies that became insolvent and went out of business in the, in the last couple of years. But I think for everyone on this journey, yeah, individual advertisers are competitors on the one hand. That's very real. But I also think that we're all in this together at the same time. And, the you know, we're getting stronger for these experiences. We're learning so much. I, I'm definitely, it's been, <laughs> the, the, the metaphor I sometimes make is like, I'm going to date myself with this, but Keanu Reeves in the Matrix, where they like plug this thing right into the back of his brain and he learns Kung Fu and all this stuff. Um, if you know what I mean. But if we look at consumer confidence, let's just take that last number that we were talking about or those last numbers. And then we line that up with advertising and with the channels. Um, I had a look and I basically polled conversion rates for Germany, France, and UK, the same markets that I polled the um, consumer confidence numbers for. And I think there's no big surprise here, but it's important to, to know that this is occurring, that there is a positive correlation between, for example, conversion rate and consumer confidence. And so what a positive correlation means in that in that sense, if consumer confidence is increasing, then conversion rates are also going to increase. Um, it's a double-edged sword. When consumer confidence is dropping, then conversion rates are going to drop. And we saw different degrees of correlation in the different markets. And there are, I'm sure, plenty of reasons for that. Um, and this is, you know, this is a quick look at the topic. You could get into a lot more detail here. But in Germany, for example, we saw a pretty weak correlation at 0.3. 
And remember that a correlation can go anywhere from minus one, which is a, a perfect inverse correlation, up to a positive one, which is a perfect um, positive correlation. So in France, we saw this moderate positive correlation at 0.5. And then in UK, we saw a rather strong positive correlation at 0.7. That's getting pretty strong. Um, considering how many things go into a complex metric like conversion rate and how many things go into uh, one of these macro trends like consumer confidence, it's interesting to see the way that they get paired. So unfortunately, that's been a challenge for the UK. As I mentioned, there's a strong correlation there and they have seen the steepest drops in conversion rate. And they also saw the highest highs, uh, by the way, in, in consumer confidence. So this means that they've seen kind of the most whiplash in conversion rate. And in year-on-year -year terms, that just sucks. There's no other way to say it. I just think it's really important and can't be understated that when you're looking at a campaign or at at an advertising account, it's just so complex to understand what's going on there. And it's easy to say, this is my fault, or this campaign um, stinks, or this channel's not performing. And people have a tendency to just look at their channel or their campaigns in isolation and forget the significance of, of the macro trend. And you have to look at the big and strong effects that these, you know, sometimes seemingly invisible forces can have on something as insignificant as your advertising campaigns that you have a revenue dependency on. Um, and so, you know, I think the lesson there is to follow this stuff and yeah, be easy on yourself to a certain extent. And also remember that your competitors are facing these same challenges Again, we're not alone when we're dealing with these things. And I just wanted to dig up one more. When I was thinking about these correlations, I remembered something I looked at earlier in 2022, which is, it just proves a point. I mean, it's a little bit less relevant now, but it's just fascinating. I looked at the correlation between retail mobility, basically how often are people visiting offline stores and COVID stringency which is how intense are lockdown measures. And these two things move in like basically perfect opposition to each other, which is obvious. Like, in other words, when lockdown measures are stronger, uh, people are going to brick and mortar less. It's very easily demonstrable. I mean, we all know it to be true, but you can also prove it. What was then really interesting though, was to layer Google Shopping CPC on this and in Germany, for example, I didn't see this everywhere. It's just such a complex, multivariate environment. But in Germany, this trend was pretty clear that Google Shopping C CPC or cost per click was, was tightly mapped, you could almost say, to retail mobility or inversely to lockdown, how, how tough are lockdowns. So basically, when retail mobility is increasing, in other words, when people are visiting offline sales, uh, offline stores more, on Google Shopping, the cost per click, the unit costs increase. It becomes more expensive to advertise um, in that in in that environment. And so we, you could just watch this trend, um, the two lines moving up and down with each other over the course of the last couple of years. And then I, I haven't updated that also. The retail mobility data, for example, comes from Google and they've stopped providing that. Um, it just became less of a topic as lockdowns went away. So, you know, that's an effect that you you might have seen fluctuations in your CPC over time and you have no idea that it's being invisibly steered by these offline closures or you, you might suspect it, but there it is in the data. So that was a significant trend of the last couple of years and all the way through at least the middle of 2022. But if we look at 2022 in some more detail, um, I want to look at like the shopping funnel health and I'll look at the UK and Germany for that. So what do I mean by funnel health? I just mean, you know, impressions down to clicks, down to conversions. And how is that, how is that looking these days? And I won't sugarcoat this in the uk what we saw 
hurt a lot. I mean, bearing in mind, that's where we saw the worst consumer confidence. It was a, definitely a tricky time for in the UK. We've generally, I think the UK is one of the most competitive markets in the world in terms of Google Shopping. If you look at the way cost per click has developed there over the last couple of years, it's just been brutal. It's been a relentless upward march. Um, we'll talk more about CPC in a bit. 2022 was actually in some ways a positive year in that regard. We'll get to that. But the funnel health wasn't great. Impressions were down year over year. Clicks were down even more and conversions were down even more than that. Um, and this was a pretty steady trend until, yeah, about October, we started seeing a little tipping point here. Um, actually, I think in September is where we see clicks kind of, this is on an index basis where the, the clicks index of 2022 compared to 2021, um, the, the clicks start climbing above impressions at that point. So before you had like a visibility problem, an even worse click problem and an even worse conversion problem uh, pointing toward your click-through rate and your conversion rate. These were struggling. And the click-through rate started to look better around September. And the conversion rates started to really over-index and really start improving in October. And they held that way November and December. And this could be related to that uptick in consumer confidence that I mentioned and the downtick in, in inflation rates that did occur in the last months of the year. It seemed to have a big effect on consumers and the conversion rates and conversions looked really positive at the end of the year. So that's the one positive I can put on that. If we look at Germany, the funnel health was totally different. So it's really interesting. Um, what we mostly saw was, especially as the year progressed, we saw more and more cases of impressions under indexing relative to 2021. So it was actually a visibility problem in Germany. And what's interesting is that clicks and conversions were pretty healthy. And that also increased in the second half of the year, um, particularly in Q4. Q3, late Q3 and Q4. I think it's really interesting to see how these markets develop and how different they are from each other. And you have to remember that when you're doing cross-border commerce and you're advertising in different target countries, that uh, each of these markets is so unique and you, it's very much worth understanding what's occurring at, in the macroeconomic level and finding any way that you can to benchmark against peers or understand what's going out there in the broader environment. If we look at the UK and we look at revenue development um, in particular, yeah, the indexed revenue was facing real challenges in January, February. Those were the worst months of the year that we saw. Um, and of course, those, if you think back on January, February, 2021, we were definitely, those were still bubble months. January was a surprisingly huge month in e-commerce, um, at least in our experience, uh, January of 2021. And it was still in this COVID lockdown context. Things really jumped up already in, in March in year over year terms. And um, it's a trend that just continued going up and up and up and th across the year over the course of the year. Um, where we finally started seeing positive year-over-year -year outcomes in October. November was still down a bit, um, but then a really strong December in the UK. That's what we observed. To make that a little more specific, we were seeing like minus 18% year-over-year revenue in like March and April, um, climbing, clawing its way up to, you know, positive uh, three, four percent in October and finishing with a really strong December that was up uh, about six percent year over year. And I can't claim that that's representative of the of the market. It's our little sample of the market. It's our little corner. Um, but I think it's it's positive to see and 
you know, if you compare it against the, the Salesforce shopping figures, um, it's largely in line with those. Although I'd say we saw a little more recovery than, than what was reported, including seeing the numbers come up year over year where they, they remained negative year over year, according to Salesforce. And again, the channel is its own beast. It's not the total e-commerce environment. It's not representing total e-commerce revenue. So they're just, they're apples to oranges. It's, it's, it's worth mentioning, but for what it's worth. And regarding Germany, again, this is our little sample of the market because we were generally seeing numbers up year over year for the entire year in terms of aggregate shopping and, and performance max uh, revenue development in Germany. And that shows you right there. I mean, we see from the e-commerce figures from Salesforce that Germany was below the 0% line all year long. And definitely we we know merchants who experience that as well. Don't want to say that everyone was up year over year. That's not the case. But in aggregate, um, we did see we did see an improvement there. And it was it's a bit of a noisier um, movement. It's a bit harder to see a clear trend line. Like in the UK, we saw really a pretty steady progression closer to and then above that 0% year over year line. And in Germany, I would say there was also broadly speaking an upward trend, but there was a lot of fluctuation in that. Getting to cost per click, I looked at a couple of things here. One, I looked at a historic kind of look back of Google's self-reported cost per click that comes from their earnings statements. Um, they don't tell you the cost per click, but they tell you what's occurring year over year with cost per clicks. And you have to remember that that's all geographies um, or all markets, all verticals. So even e-commerce and also, you know, travel and booking and, and stuff like that. Um it's all ad inventory. So it's it's like a perfect CPC soup. You, you can't read something too specific out of that. But what was interesting was to then look at the e-commerce benchmark CPC, which is, you know, zeroing in on mostly European merchants um, in e-commerce verticals and ranging all kinds of verticals. And then in terms of ad inventory, looking at shopping and, and performance max. Um, which of course is its own mini placement soup. But as we know, it, it consists of like 89% um, shopping and dynamic remarketing on average. But when you hold those two in comparison to each other, we could see that in 2022, um, in year over year terms, the e-commerce benchmark CPC remained elevated more than the, the Google CPC, like actually over the course of the year, and this this only goes through Q3 because I, I still don't think the Q4 figures are published yet, but at time of recording, um, they're, they're not. What do I want to say? Though? Oh yeah, over the course of the year, like in Q2, uh, that's when Google C, Google's self-reported CPCs crossed the the zero point on year over year. So they, we start seeing CPC relief, negative, negative developments year over year. Um, and then it got even a little bit deeper in Q3, whereas in e-commerce, we finally reached the 0% mark in Q3 of 2022. If we look at CPCs in absolute terms, and let's just add a little more segmentation in there, we can look at four markets, France, Germany, Netherlands, UK. The UK, as I mentioned earlier, they've had brutal CPC development the last years, to be honest. It's just been up and up and up. Um, but on a positive note, we did see relief coming in September, October, November on CPCs in the UK. And that's something that they haven't seen in that extent. And for that amount of time, you know, over a quarter of relief in a very long time. And I hope that that trend continues. Probably the most painful development in contrast was in the Netherlands, which I include because it's just one of my favorite markets. I, I find them interesting. And we saw that they had really high inflation. Now, this is a controversial opinion. I typically think of CPCs as actually kind of a good, I don't know how to phrase this, like store of value relative to inflation. That sounds like I'm talking about crypto now. 
Uh, Lord help me. <clears throat> um, no, but actually when you look at the year over year developments in, in cost per click, um, and you look at what occurred in inflation year over year, technically cost per clicks got cheaper. And no one says this and everyone talks about how painful CPCs are. And I get that. But relative to what happened in the broader economy in terms of inflation, I just want to say it could have been a lot worse. Um, and yeah, depending on your market and vertical combination and your specific competitor set, we know people facing massive CPC increases, absolutely massive. So I don't want to sweep that under the rug. I don't want to say that isn't happening, but in aggregate, like the big picture, um, it could actually be worse. Uh, but back to Netherlands, who I wanted to mention, they did have really high inflation and they also had strong gains in CPC. So to what extent is that related? I can't tell you, but they spent most of the year below Germany in terms of cost per click. And bear in mind what a larger economy Germany is than Netherlands. Um, I'd have to check like how the, you know, purchasing power parity is between those. I think cost of living is pretty high in Netherlands. Typically, CPC is pretty closely matching uh, cost of living measurements. But Netherlands did in September and for the rest of the year, they... They did not see relief the way that the UK did. They saw higher CPCs than ever, and it crossed in front of Germany. Uh, Germany had rather stable CPCs over the year. Um, and yep, Netherlands <laughs> sadly crossed that crossed that line. So things quite pricey in Netherlands right now in, in the channel. Um, France was, had, had the, enjoyed the lowest CPCs, and they even enjoyed some months below 30 cents on average per click, uh, which no other market saw levels that low. Um, UK, for references, was pushing 50 cents per click in June. And that's in euros, bear in mind. So I don't know, I'd have to do the conversion rate for pounds. So e-commerce CPCs higher than and seeing more year over year um, costs than than, you know, the aggregate CPCs for all of Google. But it, it varies per market. So another thing, when you're, anytime you're getting to cross-border advertising, you just need to do some research and find out what's occurring in that market and what's, what's kind of the norm there. And who are the competitors? <laughs> Which brings me to my next topic. Let's talk about competition. Generally, we saw that in the first half of the year, the unique shopping competitors per account. So just imagine to explain this, you're a median advertiser um, and you've got X number of account level competitors, let's say 50 or something like that. Uh, in January, that number was down 10% year over year. And it only approached the 0% line in the first half of the year. It only approached the 0% mark in March. It spent the whole first half of the year uh, with lower Comp number of unique competitors than the year before for what it's worth. But then in the second half of the year, um, the competition start piling on for whatever reason. I, I, I can only speculate as to what caused that. But we then saw a steady upward trend peaking, no surprise, in November with, um, you know, 15% growth in unique competitors year over year. So that was a painful development from, from January where you're down, you have almost 10% fewer unique competitors than a year ago to November, your peak season where you're, you've got 15% more than you did last year. And I always like to look at Amazon in particular because they are so big that they just tend to, to dominate the industry. I remember when they dropped out of the shopping auction in the acute phase of the pandemic in like March, April, 2020. Uh, CPCs also dropped quite a bit and there could be other reasons why that occurred. But as soon as Amazon came back in the auction again, CPCs, yeah, they were still a kind of a discount for different reasons, but they popped back up again as soon as Amazon turned their ads back on. Uh, but in regards to this year, 
I looked at Amazon's presence in the peak season period and <clears throat> they were fluctuating between uh, about plus or minus 5% more competitive than they were last year. So to me, yeah, the trend is there was no trend. Um, they, but the big picture there is that they are just a dominant force in the auction. And so actually you can just say that they stayed dominant, that persisted. And that does have an effect on, you know, it depends. Look at your overlap rate. You might see overlap rates of like 80% with Amazon. And then check how much you're outranking them or rather you can do the inverse and see how often they're outranking you. And you see that they're just absolutely a brutal competitor in the auction environment. I also had a look like per, um, per vertical. And I, I looked at six different verticals there. Um, apparel and accessories, electronics, furniture, health and beauty, home and garden, home and garden, sporting goods. And they're just strong. You know, what I did was to look at basically the min max and middle 50%, what advertisers are seeing in terms of Amazon's auction strength in each of those industries. And, um, they're the strongest in home and garden. And they also have kind of the tightest range there. So they're just really consistently strong in home and garden. Electronics, probably not such a surprise. Um, they, they're they also quite strong. The range is a little bit looser. So there's more kind of outcomes you'll see. Um, and, it, you know, their weakest areas are furniture and fashion. Those are areas that they're, they're not dominating for different reasons why uh, because that competitive power takes a look at their impression share in google ads it takes a look at their overlap rate and their out and the outranking um, so you know it could be that they're just not budgeted and not bidding quite as aggressively in those industries um, it could be that it's easier to outrank them in those industries i'd have to dig into that to be honest um, and it may be because their brand power or their value proposition not quite as strong in fashion or furniture. So while we're speaking about competition, I want to talk about one last thing before I let you go. Thanks for listening so far. I want to talk to you about Performance Max adoption. And why does that connect to competition? For me, the big question with some of that technology, same as always, same as ever, is, yeah, if everyone's using it, how do you really differentiate? Um, you're using this. It's like having the same self-driving car as everyone else and being in a race against those people. I think it's a really interesting thought experiment. I think Google themselves don't quite know the answer to that. Um, in my opinion, the way forward there is to have better inputs and outputs for that machine to operate on but it's a conversation for another time but let's just look at the adoption really quick um, I, I looked at this in two different views I'll go in the detailed view first which was basically looking at the the cost share of performance max smart shopping and standard shopping from 2019 to present and by the way if you want to see these charts um, <clears throat> I, I got to check. We'll have them hosted in different places, like on our website, on YouTube, I think. And, and just reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter and I'll, I'll send you the actual chart so you can, you can see some of the things I'm talking about here. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, again, looking at the cost share, which you could view as a measure of adoption for these three campaign types over time, um, you see that smart shopping was steadily gaining a share of cost over time. And then in 2022, the damnedest thing happened and Performance Max got flipped on like a, a, like a light switch. And it's, it's so fascinating to see how fast that adoption occurred. It's really like a hockey stick. It's an exponential thing. Um, and particularly, like it, actually in the later part of the year, it got a little bumpy. I mean, at that point, most of the adoption had occurred, but there's there's kind of some holdouts where for different reasons, there are people, for example, search ads, 360 users who couldn't migrate to performance max or things like that. Um, 
But if we look at the total adoption of shopping ads automation, let's call it that, you know, if we combine the cost share of smart shopping campaigns and the cost share of performance max over time, um, so that we've got this, this lumped category, you see that it raised from like <clears throat> about 5% in January of 2019, very new technology, not well adopted, a lot of questions about that. And, um, it just did nothing but rise until the present date where it's it's at 60% in the in the, the analysis that I provided. But speaking from experience, we know from our kind of uh, core client base that it's even higher than that. It's more like 70%. And I don't know, if you talk to John Cave from Shoptimized, he's written, check out his blog, he's written a couple of reports about PMAX adoption in the past. And he was already seeing 66% in January of last year. So, or or at the start of the year, rather, in January of 2022, at the start of the year. Um, So it also depends on market. Like he's primarily based in the UK. We also have UK advertisers. Uh, It just seems like the adoption is higher there. Makes me wonder if that has something to do with their relentless CPC March. Hmm. Idea just flashed across my mind. But um, at any rate, I think something that's really interesting here is that big picture performance max didn't change this trend at all. There's just been a nice, steady, smooth increase in the share of, of wallet for shopping ads automation, these different technologies. And that number didn't jump. It didn't fall. Nothing really happened. It just it just continued the exact trajectory that it was always on. Um, so from Google's perspective, you know, they're getting closer and closer to owning all of the spend out there, which I'm sure they're quite happy about. Um, Performance Max w- did not change that trend for them. I think the big win for Google in those regards is that they can direct more spend at, you know, YouTube, Gmail, et cetera, places where people were not necessarily spending before. They've got more as Patrick Gilbert would call it, I've, sp- I've interviewed him on a previous episode of the podcast, they've got more liquidity in the bidding environment. In other words, they've got fewer constraints. They've got more degrees of freedom. Um, there's a lot that they can do to control the, the total auction environment at that point. But yeah, I think that's what I wanted to bring you up to speed on for 2022. I hope this information was helpful to you. Um If you disagree with anything I said, if I got something wrong, if you saw something that was so different or so much the same, you know, share that with me online. I'm really happy to to hear what's up in in your accounts and what you've been seeing. I won't keep you any longer. Thanks for listening to Growing E-Commerce. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider sharing it with coworkers, friends, or within your professional network. We really appreciate that. The podcast is produced by Smarter E-Commerce, also known as SMEC. To learn more, visit smarter-ecommerce.com.